Yes, it's working. Excellent. It's working. <laughs> Brilliant. I think it's working anyway. Um, so if you can watch, if you're watching live, let us know if you can see us. Uh, now there's. Okay, I just have to mute. Uh, can you still hear me, Kate? Yes, I can. Okay, okay. Well, we're live. Could, could you see the um, the chat box? I can keep an eye on that if you can't see No, it. I can't because I have your Zoom up, which means I can't see the YouTube video at the same time. Oh, yeah. Well, here, anybody who's watching this, I have tried to do this about three times. And every time, as some of you will know, <laughs> it hasn't worked. And I did lots of YouTube tutorials and I finally thought I figured out the problem and it looks like I have. So this is a very exciting moment. I'm very, very happy right now if you're watching live. Uh, brilliant. If you're not, he's still very happy, but yes. he was previously and may well not be happy now. There I is know, no yes. It comes and goes, which is maybe something that we'll be talking about uh, at some stage uh, this evening. So hello, everybody. Welcome. Kate, you are in charge, actually, so maybe I shouldn't be welcoming people. But I do want you to kind of tell us a little bit about who you are, uh, how you got connected with my work and that kind of stuff. So uh, should I hand over to you briefly and tell us um, your story? Okay. It's really uh, not very interesting, but if you insist. Um, so I grew up in church and was in church forever. And um, then, oh, I probably should just say, because uh, it's uh, going to come up at some point. Otherwise, my kids who are nine and five are watching this. Um, hi, boys. So I need to be a little bit careful what I say, <laughs> just because they're watching. So I will have to not be too mean to you, um, or at least try. I do find that yes. hard. I've got to be I honest. Know. And I am also very aware that people are watching this and may not quite know how mean I am to you. So <laughs> that might be a bit of a shock. Um, there is some affection there occasionally. Yes, a little, but... a tiny bit, <laughs> an, e an echo. Uh, an aroma of affection. <laughs> well, I've got to balance it out because everyone else is so nice to you and treats you in the pyro community like you know stuff that I've just got to yeah. balance it to make sure that you don't get too big headed. That's true. That's true. You don't see what comments are made about me online. Actually, no, there's, I don't get any bad comments. I have to say I'm very lucky. Um, touch I filtered them for you. I, I take yes. them out before you can see them to protect you. Um, well, thank you. <laughs> yeah. You're welcome. Yeah. Because um, Kate and I have been working together for a little while, but you'll get into that. So Kate has been working with me on this platform. and uh, But yes, you tell the story. Yeah. So um, ended up um, getting divorced. And um, it was a bit of a shock at the time. I had a three-month-old at home and a four-year-old. And it was catastrophic shall we just say to my whole structure and understanding of the world particularly the kind of wonderful deus ex machina um slot machine god where you put your prayers in and then the answers come out and you get what you want and suddenly that wasn't working um and i couldn't quite understand why not then pete's false advertising kicked in um i happened to be listening to a broadcast uh I hate the fact that everyone at the time seemed to be coming through that way, but I was one of them. And Pete falsely said, I'm doing this thing called Atheism for Lent, and you can come and temporarily for a short period of time um, use atheistic critique of Christianity to strengthen your faith. And I thought, oh, everything's been so shaken. What an excellent idea. I will do a short 40-day period where I use this atheistic critique to strengthen the foundation that is absolutely there and absolutely solid and of course it's going to be fine because we all know that this is what God is like and this is what he looks like and this is how he works so of course that's going to be not a problem um so I thought I was very clever and it took three days and the first day I think I commented that I was disappointed that we weren't getting into it sooner 
And then by the third day, I posted in the then Facebook group that was very active to say, oh, my goodness, everything has just collapsed. And I never quite recovered from that. So I still blame you. And I still think it's false advertising. But I am also quite grateful. Um, It has been a long process since then, and we will get to that later. But there was very much a dismantling of all of the structures and concepts and wonderful master signifiers and big others and all other ways that you want to talk about it. Um, But it was very funny because I was very aware that I was a professional at one point um, with a very good job, my own home, my own car, a lovely marriage, child, it was all idyllic and wonderful, moved country, and then everything fell apart. And then I suddenly became a single mother on benefits, two kids at home, no job, uh, for various reasons. And it felt like literally the whole world collapsed. And then somehow I found I was happier than I'd ever been. And slowly things have been added back in, and I now thankfully have a job again and a profession and sort of have my own home and have children. And again, unfortunately, thanks to you, I'm in a quite a good relationship. Um, yeah. Hi, Bill. <laughs> um, but I wouldn't be where I am now if it wasn't for that complete breaking process. Hmm. So, uh, you know, it kind of like, uh, it's kind of counterintuitive because in some senses, you know, things in your life were beginning to fall apart. And this this work, discovering, you know, atheism for Len and going into that, it, it, it didn't kind of take you in the opposite direction. It seems like for the way you describe it, it, it kind of like drew, pushed you even deeper into the darkness and the brokenness, um, which is kind of a counterintuitive idea. Uh, can you talk well, about I, how that I worked? felt like I was drowning and so was reaching out for a way to latch on to security. Mm-hmm. And you very kindly refused to give that to me. And so then I started thinking even more <laughs> and then realized that actually there was a way in which I could swim without holding on to something for dear life. And so it's been more of a process of learning to swim in the water rather than trying to hold on to something to pull me out of it. Yeah, because you, um, I mean, you threw yourself very heavily into this. There was a quote, actually, you mentioned Rob Bell, because uh, you mentioned me being on his podcast. There is a quote that he has in the, on the front of one of my books where he said, um, uh, he said, the book feels like it pushes you to the edge of a cliff. And just when you feel you're going to be pulled back, uh, Peter pushes you off the cliff, uh, but it feels like flying, which is a lovely quote. I'm very pleased that he said that, you know, but it's um, there is a sense in which atheism for Lent is kind of like that. It takes you to the the edge. And in some respects, it sounds like you were, you know, in one sense going, this might pull me back from the edge, but mm-hmm. it pushed you over. But somehow that was a liberating kind of emancipatory experience. Yeah, I'm trying to work out if I, sorry, the shaky camera. Uh, I'm trying to work out if I would describe it as flying. That's a little bit too positive. Um, (laughs) The experience was traumatic in the extreme. Mm. There was a lot of falling. Um, But then the hope is that you find a way to realize that you're not falling you're just kind of floating so flying suggests that you take off again or you somehow are in control of it or you are somehow uh moving forward whereas this is learning to live without a ground underneath your feet yeah um did you feel you know that in a sense what happened is that that course connected you with the falling that was already happening in you so was it a sense in which already things were broken and it it was it didn't kind of so much push you off the edge but but potentially give you a way to get a purchase on what was happening or a language for what was happening 
Well, it depends whether you're asking how I felt at the time or how I feel now. So at the time, it felt like I had a house. It crumbled, but I had this foundation that I knew was really solid. And you came along and went, yeah, but you've got termites or some other. Yeah, but actually, it's not a foundation at all. It's not real. It's it needs to come out. And instead, rather than there being a solid foundation that I could rebuild on, the foundation was taken away. Mm. And then I realized that I didn't need that structure anyway. So I've learned to live without it. Mm. And I don't have a reformulation yet. I have been living for the last couple of years because this was, oh, probably should say this was at the start of the pandemic um so in amongst all of this was everything over the last few years um so that helped too it was great um and there hasn't been an opportunity to work on trying to find a new structure to stand on I actually don't have any interest in that right now Um, If anybody asks me what I think about, is there a God? What is God like? I'm trying not to use gender. Um, And what would it look like? Blah, blah, blah. The answer is just, I don't know. And I'm happy with that. I, I don't need to explore that too much at the moment I think there will come a time when I need to do that more and more when I need something but I've spent three and a half decades with a very solid structure that has had no room no life no movement in it and actually it's taken me three and a half years so far to just live without it and explore what that means for me, how that looks, what that means for the way that I live, what my focus is on. And it's been an emancipation. I will be honest, the best description that I heard it described as recently was I started off feeling a bit like the disciples after the crucifixion, um, where you live thinking things are going in one direction and suddenly you get a complete decentering experience, a key in you know introduction of the real, however you want to phrase it. Suddenly some an event happens that completely destabilizes, decenters and throws you off course. And then you just sit there and you go, what on earth is happening? But you then wait and this feels more like the waiting before I feel the need to find something else. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, that might be, you know, like one of the, whenever I started my work, uh, it was, my first book was all about doubt, ambiguity, complexity. And it was about kind of like showing how that was part of religious traditions. Uh, But often, you know, uh, people would see it as either a kind of preparation. You kind of deconstruct what was what wasn't working, and then maybe reconstruct something new, or you can take apart a certain amount of things, and something remains. Uh, there's a certain sense in which, you know, the work is trying to potentially explore this idea that there is a dimension of reality that we we live in that disruption it's not that you disrupt or deconstruct and then reconstruct that there's something about living in this disruptive moment not in you know not in a day-to-day life you know not but maybe once a week or once a month we have practices that disrupt us that disorient us that that draw us into unknowing complexity and doubt in a way that opens up new possibilities. And it's kind of almost like keeping that alive within us is the task until the day that we die. And if we did it 10 years ago, or if we're doing it today, it doesn't mean we're going to do it tomorrow. It's like love and relationships. Just because you're good at it today doesn't mean you're going to be good at it tomorrow. And just because 
you're open to being destabilized today. It's like, how do I, how do I stay open to that invitation? As you said, of the real or the apocalyptic, uh, how do I stay open to that invitation in my life? And uh, that's definitely very central to to the work that we're exploring with with this power theology. Well, in order to turn the tables a little bit, then you have talked before about if you deconstruct a little bit and you question a little bit and you only go so far. But say you are in a church situation and you consciously might experience the death of God and you might go through that process. But unconsciously, the liturgy and the rituals and the way that the service acts does the believing for you. Mm -hmm. So you haven't completely gone through that process just to a certain point and then you're protected in the same way that you've talked about um, the boy's bedroom when um, the boy died and his parents kept the bedroom exactly the same. They were protected yes. from the grief until it came to dismantling the bedroom. And then when that was taken away, that's when the grief was felt. Yes. Um, how do you think it's possible? Because one of the big problems that we've noticed in the community is that when people go through this process, often they feel like they need to leave the church because it feels inauthentic to be there, or it feels like they're having to deny who they are really and the journey that they're going on um, because they no longer fit with the belief patterns that are around them, which inevitably means that you lose community, you lose the support structures, you lose the relationships that you had. So is it an inevitable thing that you feel happens that people then get isolated because we don't currently have an international network of pyrotheology <laughs> live events yes. in every city across the world, uh, maybe one day. So yes. is it that people are isolated on their own or is there a way to um, manage that better? Yeah. And this is a, a 500 year plan. I mean, when I started this work for me, it was always like a 500 year plan and I may not be around to see where it ends up. You know, I'm not saying for sure, but I may not last the, the whole time. <laughs> um, so it's, it's going to take a long time before we see these ideas, you know, really, I think, expressed liturgically and in various places around the world. Absolutely. Can I also unpack the brilliant thing you said at the beginning of this? Um, I'll unpack that a little bit and then come back to this, the question, which is central. Um, what Kate was talking about is something I haven't talked about recently, but it's very central to this work is that if you think about conservative churches, often what you believe is important. Now, you don't necessarily have to believe the belief, right? But you, as long as you say it, you kind of, you know, you, you kind of go along with a certain set of beliefs. And then in more liberal churches, you can actually doubt, have questions, you, you can doubt everything. But the liturgy often continues to be hymns and sermons about, you know, God being there and providing. So the, the liturgy has a certain kind of uh, comfort and certainty so that you can intellectually doubt, like the parent who doesn't believe in, oh, I won't say anything because there's kids watching, but there's there's a certain sense in which... um. Uh, uh, you know, we don't have to believe something consciously, but the the structure can believe for us. And then what parotheology does is it tries to create a liturgical structure in which doubt, ambiguity and complexity is actually woven into the structure itself. So in other words, you kind of experience the horror, you experience doubt and unknowing you, you through the liturgy, uh, which kind of in one sense symbolizes the absolute, whether someone consciously believes that or not if they go to say to a church without knowing it they kind of treat this the minister almost like an avatar of the absolute or god uh, and that's why if the minister says something bad it seems worse if they're dressed in their garb than if they're not so when that liturgy expresses doubt ambiguity and complexity it can be a way in which you feel it yourself just like people who mourn professional criers at a funeral in some cultures you cannot cry. You can't access your tears. They cry for you. And that helps you very gradually to experience those tears for yourself. Or a musician who sings about tragedy that might have happened in your life, 
And through hearing the tragedy in the music, you're able to access that in some way in your room. So that's kind of what paratheology partly does, creates this liturgical space to encounter this doubt and unknowing and this, this lack, which we'll maybe come back to. So the question is, once you've kind of started to experience that, you say, yeah, what do you do? Because people get isolated. And the problem is this is the very point when you shouldn't be isolated. Whenever you have strong beliefs, you can actually do pretty well without people. <laughs> uh, you know, you can, you've got your beliefs, you've got your whatever. But when you start to, to question, when you start to experience that trauma and that pain and that, as Kate said, death of God, where everything starts to collapse, that's precisely when we need people. <laughs> that's precisely when we need good art and good music and good friends. And yet that's the very point that some people get kicked out of their church or feel that they have to leave probably not get kicked out, but sometimes feel that they have to leave. So there's my 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 background. Um, and then I would love to talk with Kate with you about this. I'll say a few words, see what you think. Um, is I kind of want to say, but that you don't have to leave, that actually there is a way in which potentially, like a lot of the work that I do is trying to show that these ideas of doubt, complexity, and ambiguity are within religious traditions and within Christianity. And there might be a way for you to continue to engage with, say, a church service, partly for the community, partly for, you know, the friendships, partly for the support that it gives you, especially if maybe you're a single mom or a single parent and don't have support. And you can still get that from it. Um, but what parotheology does is like the warning on the pack of cigarettes that says if you smoke, you know, that may cause cancer, may have laxative effects or whatever. So what I'm doing is I'm putting on that sticker on the side of church saying uh, may cause laxative effects, may cause drowsiness, may cause cancer. So it kind of maybe helps you engage with it in a healthier way. But in short, like being isolated when you're going through this profound experience that you've gone through is painful um, and dangerous even sometimes. Uh, I think particularly during COVID, one thing that was really interesting was that there were a lot of people that did AFL um, in that year that it all started. And if I recall correctly, um, things started kicking off here about March time. So it was during AFL um, and it was wonderful because you were in California at the time. And so time zones were not my friend. Um, mm. And it meant that I could stay up until two, three in the morning, having conversations with people online, um, drop my kids off to nursery day, daycare, whatever you want to call it in the morning and then go home and sleep. It was wonderful. Um, but it was because we had lockdown and we had and then it became more and more intense but I noticed that after that, attendance at the online events that you were doing almost became a surrogate community lifeline for people. Mm -hmm. And there was a lot more intense interaction with a lot more people at once um, than there has been in subsequent years, particularly as churches were shut down anyway, gatherings of more than 10 people were um, prevented and then it was anyone outside of your bubble anyone outside of your household you weren't allowed to interact with and so as things became more and more shut down externally online resources and online zoom rooms and online communities flourished yeah. um, but they seem to have tapered off a bit now as people have reconnected with the outside world one thing that was really interesting for me is that as that was happening church events were still going on um, but I noticed that I switched to a different service in my church and joined a Spanish speaking service where I don't speak Spanish <laughs> yeah. um, and literally couldn't understand what they were saying it was great yeah. it was a really small group of people but we became really close and I actually became their worship leader um, yeah. whilst this was all going on I really don't play piano very well at all. Um, I can just about do chords in one hand-ish 
and sort of the basic melody in the right. It was really awful, but apparently I was the best they had. I felt very sorry for them. Mm -hmm. um, but the fact that I was playing these songs in Spanish, didn't have a clue what they meant. I sort of could guess from some of the mm -hmm. words, you kind of get used to them. Um, but it gave me that freedom to interact with the liturgy without feeling the oppression of what it actually meant. Yes, <laughs> it was very good, yeah. Yeah, so that's, like, that's sometimes why, you know, with the people like Latin mass, who don't speak Latin, because there's a certain sense in which you're engaging with, um, with something without understanding. It's quite, quite a beautiful metaphor. So, uh, one of my uh, bands I really like, uh, Sega Ross, they have a language called Hoplandic. Uh, it's not a language they made up like they speak in tongues basically they just kind of speak nonsense but uh the music is so emotive and so powerful and yet it literally there's no signification behind the signifiers um and a friend of mine johnny McEwen, uh he he actually has started going back to a church because he wants to go back to something that he can disagree with he says i quite like the so either you know do not understanding or i'm going back because i actually quite like to be in a situation where I have to hear something. And it's not because he wants to disagree with it and say that he's right. He's like, maybe I'm wrong. He, cause he loves to put himself like, I want to be in a situation where I I'm disrupted, like anything can be disruptive. So um, yeah, there's various creative ways that you can engage with um, religious communities actually. Yeah. Yeah. Just wobbly camera. Um, uh, so then my next question is I am going to by the end of this hear something personal from you. Just gonna okay. let you warn you about that <laughs> now. Because yeah. I've been listening to you for several years now. And unless secretly every story that you talk about one of your friends is about you, in which case that's quite <laughs> disturbing, worrying and concerning. It'd be very um, disturbing. Yeah. It would indeed. Yeah. Then we need to get something from you. Just something yes. small. So yeah. what I would like to know is how you manage, because you also um, had an experience of being in more of a kind of uh, confessional based Christian context. And then you went through this journey yourself. Um, how do you live in that kind of liminal space of not having that solid foundation to stand on but equally not being able to just survive forever more with nothing to hold on to and no structure yes yeah no that's a that's a great question and like the, you know this work is a personal work just in the same way that for you you actually encountered this in a personal way before you got interested in it intellectually and you kind of you have that beautiful balance you know you're you you are interested in the theory but actually it was useful for you existentially um in the same way this is kind of like this way of thinking and being is kind of first and foremost a self-cure uh you know i have i've gone through in the past bouts of depression and uh i've this kind of i've part of that depression was connected to uh, well, an inability to desire properly, where your desire kind of just stops functioning and fixation. Fixation is often where you start to think of something that you think is the answer, you know, so that you become fixated. And, you know, a lot of this work and this exploration of the enjoyment of the lack of fulfillment and the embrace of, of a type of antagonism in, in, in life, um, I have found it absolutely liberating like i find it profound um i very much uh feel a freedom uh in this type of work um and it's it's kind of like yeah so th this in, first and foremost has been a form of self-cure so i don't know if you want to ask me anything more about that but that would be my first personal you know revelation not much of a revelation really but um that that this work is not just an intellectual exercise at all. Yeah. Okay. So that's very interesting. And I'm really mm. glad that you said it, but that doesn't answer my question at all. Yeah. So yeah. I'm just going to go yeah. back to it a little bit. Absolutely. And Keep so going back until I get there. Yeah. We'll try again. Good try. Mm. Well done. Yes. But we're going to just 
do it again. Take two. Um, <laughs> take two. So the question was, if before you had a very fixed understanding of what um, your big other master signifier, et cetera, was, is God was up there in heaven, looking down, judging, you had to please him or else lightning bolts, et cetera. And then you went through the death of God process and um, you said now that you don't have an interest in the um, does God exist question because it's more of a conceptually, yes, of course, God exists. Um, but that that's more of the interesting question. Then how do you stand on a belief of anything without just switching your big other to something else or switching your object to something else? How did you basically get rid of God as your final guru, Jesus as your final guru, yeah. um, but then not have anything? Like, how do you do that? Do you just live perpetually not believing anything, not holding on to anything, not knowing anything for certain? Um, or do you hold on to things and say, I think this is the case, or I think this, but I could be wrong? Like, do you have anything that you think, no, I know this? Yeah, well, so if, interestingly, like my, I never had God or Jesus or anything like that as my, I mean, there was a brief moment I'll come back to in a second, but I um, I I grew up without any kind of religious in this standard notion of the term kind of beliefs or anything like that and and my entry into christianity was actually a rupture within my let's call it secular religion um we're just been doing a book study on richard boothby's uh it's called it was was called embracing it's called embracing the void yes so it's nothing sacred was the original title so i get confused um and at the end of that book he talks about how uh you can, one can think of uh, contemporary capitalism as a type of religion. And uh, you know, we could unpack that a little bit or not, maybe I'll take us further afield. But but my my religion was a secular one. Like I very, very much like my uh, surplus enjoyment, my desire was for potentially commodity satisfaction or like very, very kind of... Uh, not particularly religious signifiers. So whenever I had a religious experience, it was actually the cracking of that. It was the kind of the rupture, the, the, the experience that that was meaningless and nothing. It was a very negative experience. It was a pure subtraction. And then after that, I was involved in a church and I took on beliefs, but that wasn't that they they never really stuck. They never really felt that authentic. My My original experience was, this experience of radical uh, freedom from the idea of, you know, ha having a job or, uh, you know, having a relationship or uh, doing this, whatever, whatever society was telling me that I should do, the, the train track that you're on, I suddenly felt this radical freedom. I, I felt the sense in which, you, you know, you, you don't have to be woven into that narrative. So that was my primary experience. And that's what I will keep always coming back to. Uh, as I say, there was then a time where I was involved in a church for a while, but um, it was it was weirdly a conversion out of a type of secular religiosity. Like do a take three because I still don't feel I'm answering the question. So keep coming back <laughs> and we'll unpack it. Or am I getting closer to answering the question? Well, that's interesting. So it's more like you've done the opposite to a lot of people. A lot of people started in a Christian context and have moved out of it and are now working out what the third movement in the dialectic is. So they've moved into the atheistic position and now it's, well, where do we go from here? Uh, whereas you started off in a more secular atheistic position, moved into a temporary position of for all in um mm. and but then you moved out of it again um so you've almost done the reverse dialectic to a lot of people yes. yeah and, and this is probably why i'm interested in christianity because christianity was one of the discourses and one of the ways that i made sense of this disruptive experience 
Whereas for a lot of people, you know, Christianity is about belief, right? So Christianity is about a set of beliefs. That's the symptom of Christianity is that we're very belief oriented. Um, you know, you look at Judaism, it's different. It's the law. It's kind of belief isn't that important, but keeping a kosher home is what's important. Um, different religions have different symptoms, but Christianity's symptom is very connected to belief. Um, uh, but at its core, um, and again, using kind of Boothby's work here, just because it's on the back of my mind, but um, is that potentially, well, let's define religion for a second as religions are very diverse, obviously, but you could say that religion is a way of orienting somebody toward a type of radical unknowing what Freud called dusting, this this radical unknowing, this this sense of mystery, not not even a mystery of something that you just don't know because you haven't watched a YouTube video on it, but something that there's a radical unknowing uh, that's part of being human, but actually might even be wider than that, be part of reality itself. And if religion is a type of uh, relationship to that, including a defense against it, a kind of connecting you with the unknowing, but also defending you against the unknowing and helping you kind of not tarry with the unknowing, then um, uh, that's always been the key thing. And, and within Christianity, you could say that the radical idea of loving your enemy and loving your neighbor is a sense of being open to the radically un the radical unknowability of the other. This everybody is a bit of a stranger. We're a stranger to ourselves. And the people that we know most are often the people who are the strangest to us. They're the ones who can turn around and just do something crazy. And, you know, you mentioned, you know, a tragic event of, of a divorce. Often when relationships end, the person who is most familiar to you does something that is the most strange and the most impossible for you to understand. And the question is why, right? So a lot of times when people break up with somebody, the question that haunts them is why, 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 why did this happen? And, and they seek an answer. And sadly, I know some people who have lost children to suicide and it's the same question. The question, why, why did this happen? There is a radical unknowability and the most the person who you're most familiar with, your child, the one you know most of all, suddenly does something and even something so traumatic as a suicide. And you didn't see it at all. It was it's complete unknowing. The other is a mystery, a stranger, including the ones who are most familiar to us. And this idea of how do we keep open to the hurricane that is the stranger in the other that we want to dismiss, we want to get rid of, but also fascinates us? Because it's, of course, that's the part of the other that we most despise and we're most attracted to. It's an ambivalent relationship to, you know, that whenever someone does something that's completely unexpected, it's, it can be the very thing that makes you, you know, fall in love with somebody is that, that unexpected dimension. But if love of your enemy and love of your neighbor is uh, an invitation to remain open to that unknown dimension of the other, then it's not really about belief, belief in this or that or anything like that. It's about an orientation to the world. And that that's what I, I, I think I intuited early on, but it took me a long time to kind of unpack it and put words to it. But my experience was that Religion's not about belief. It's about something much more disturbing than that. It's not rocket science. It's much more difficult. Because rocket science is about belief, right? About knowing things. <laughs> but loving someone, I mean, that's a lot more difficult. So almost the third point in the dialectic for someone who started out in a Christian position and then went through this Doubting, and questioning, death of God phase, uh, the next stage in the dialectic could be um, returning to a Christian worldview, but without the symptom of belief and the requirement to believe, but more just taking the um, 
oh, I liked how you phrased it frustratingly, um, that it's more about your um, relationship to the other, the way you interact in the world, the way that you um, view the world in light of the Christian worldview. Yeah. Um, so you're still holding on to something that might feel like an integral part of you and how you see things, but without the almost oppressive need to believe the right things. Yes. Like I, I would say, like, if you want, if, if I express the dialectic in, and, and this is actually a very personal way of describing it, because I feel like my life has been split into three parts, actually weirdly three decades. And, and uh, symbolically, you could say the first is you give up everything for God. The second, you give up everything, including God. And then the third is you find God in the giving up. And but now and when I use the word God there, it can be anything. So you can give up everything for like, you know, to for your career, for your whatever, right? And so you lose everything for that. And that's the militant. The militant is one that I give up everything for this love. I give up everything for this business. I give up everything for this. Then the garden of Gethsemane moment. So maybe, you know, like you know, there's the, there's the, uh, what would be the Jesus kind of like saying to God, I give up everything for you, right? Then there's the garden of Gethsemane moment is which you lose everything, including God. That's where everything falls apart. Often whenever you get the thing, sometimes it's when you lose it. Sometimes it's when you get it. I had a friend who's an actor who his first big movie role, he, um, he despaired because he spent so long thinking that that's what he wanted. And when he got it uh, and he was on a movie and all of this, he was in his, his room just, and suddenly he just fell apart. Uh, so that's the losing everything, including the sacred object, the absolute. And then the third, yes, move the dialectic is realizing that uh, you, it's not about loving God. It's when you love, like it's, or loving the absolute. It's when you love the absolute is there. So it's you, so a better way of saying it would be, uh, you do not love the sacred object when you love uh, the sacred is the sacred dimension is opened up and the sacred dimension, not in a woo woo way, but more in the sense of that in this abyss of simply being open to the other and the other being open to you. That's where you fulfill the religious injunction in in the same time as you kind of like have left it behind but you've fulfilled it yeah so that's the three that's the three steps i think i like that <laughs> so you've talked a lot about boothby i've noticed that you do have a tendency to find something get very excited about it and then spend months on end focusing entirely on that thing and everything oh. you talk about becomes about that um Last year, for those of you who were here and were subjected to nearly a year of the four discourses, uh, yes. you all know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, just because I feel like we have a complete imbalance that you talk about the kind an awful lot. You talk mm. about the fact that you had psychoanalysis. You don't talk about the psychoanalysis, which is perfectly reasonable. Um, I'm happy to, by the way. It'd be quite, you know. Um, anyway, keep going. But really, we can circle back to this now with 15 minutes left. We could have done a whole <laughs> session just on your psychoanalysis. But anyway, virtually um, nothing happened. I did Lacanian analysis. No, nothing was said by either of us. We spent a lot of time just saying nothing, <laughs> pretty much. Um, but I have never heard you say a single word against Lacan. Everything I've heard from you is Lacan is brilliant. He has these structures. He talks about things in this way. He has the decree. He has his seminars. He has all these kind of structures. And we're going to use them to talk about things as if they are the new gospel. Um, and that does not seem either balanced, dialectic or dialectical um, or in any way helpful. Um, mm -hmm. So I would like you right now to come up with three legitimate critiques of Lacan and why he's not as great as everyone thinks. Thank you. Uh -huh. Okay. Yes. Very good. Um, 
You know, that is interesting. I, I, I am a very, I'm not a scholar so much as I pick bits and pieces. So like I, when I finished my PhD, I, I, never taught one course in university. I actually did teach one course once, but but um I did it purely as I as a means to kind of understand and you know explore the world. Uh, there's been various thinkers on the way that have been very key to me. Funnily enough, uh, Derrida was uh, an early influence, but I'm not really into him very much. And and by the time I started doing my work publicly, that was kind of I was elsewhere. Um, so with Lacan I use a lot of his stuff. I'm very influenced by him. Uh, there is a reason for that, but it's actually a particular part of Lacan. Um, uh, what he does very brilliantly, I think, is, although you want to say, me to say negative things, so I won't say the brilliant bit too much, <laughs> but is, um, you know, f finds a way to articulate negativity and rupture and the centrality of a type of unknowing and contradiction at the heart of subjectivity. So that's what I like about him. However, I mean, these are superficial things, but he's a nightmare. He's a nightmare to read. He seemed like he was not really, I mean, a bit of an egotistical guy. Um, some of his work is frustratingly and uh, unwarrantedly complicated and circular and uh although he probably kind of partly does that because he wants you to work so um i mean lacan i would hardly recommend anybody actually read him you know, or, or or read his seminars he is so so uh difficult but that is that a critique that he's very difficult that's not much of a critique is it you it sounds to... almost like one of those challenges that yeah. a parent say to a child like oh this is a really hard book to read I I don't know if you're big enough to manage it now you know, and then it makes you really want to do it um but well, you're very good course, at that you you're like I I love this about some people sometimes whenever you go like oh this stuff's difficult that puts some people off but there's people like you who are like I want to read the difficult stuff and you're 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 work you're a doctor you're a medical doctor and um it's very different field and you just threw yourself into the stuff and the more I try to put you off the more you just went for it I'm stubborn and I don't yeah. like to be told what I can do and what I can't so. <laughs> that's brilliant here, I have a cheat, by the way, and my friend Phil Harrison, who's next door, he'll get this. I've got a poker game I'm playing after this. We play poker every now and again. And Phil Harrison, he's a great author, and uh, people should check him out. He did really hates chat GPT, and he really hates AGI stuff. And I share a lot of the critiques with him. But I have found that when you're reading a difficult thinker like Lacan or Deleuze, and you come up against paragraph after paragraph you don't understand... I have been incredibly impressed at how well ChatGBT does at translating really difficult philosophical texts. Uh, and I, I tested, I was testing it six months ago and it wasn't great, but whatever they have done recently, it's almost scary how, how good it can be if you're reading these difficult texts, just having ChatGPT open and asking it questions. You can't fully rely on it, but uh, I've been very impressed. I'm reading Anti Oedipus at the moment, rereading it for I haven't read it for a long time, and and uh, ChatGPT is doing very good. So does this mean we're next going to be looking at Deleuze and Guattari? No. I hate Deleuze and Guattari. I do, I'm not a fan of them at all, at all, at all. So no, you don't. Uh, thankfully for anybody who's interested, you, I will not put you through Deleuze. Um, there's stuff that's good there, but I actually think it's dangerous. I just, I mean, I, I like there's some good stuff in Deleuze, but I don't know. I, I'm just, uh, yeah, I, I, I'm not a Deleuzean. Yeah. Uh, I'm in a reading group for what is philosophy at the moment. And we're doing yeah. concepts and planes, and it's very interesting. Very interesting. Like, I mean, he is like there is a. I mean, I, I can't say it, but there's almost like a valorization of schizophrenia, not necessarily as a pathological symptom, but the schizophrenic for them is like the um, the uh, kind of the model for human subjectivity, and um, 
and I have some friends who who have schizophrenic kind of backgrounds and they do always enjoy Deleuze. If they're very smart and they've got schizophrenia, they do enjoy Deleuze because, you know, they kind of resonate with the work. But but the idea that the schizophrenic is a is a model for um, kind of breaking free from social convention and finding new what they would call uh, what kind of lines of flight and kind of deterritorial like basically this radical freedom i just i just can't go there like i don't know so are you a little bit uh hypocritical then because you say that you're not going to take the whole of lacan's work and apply it but you're just going to cherry pick a few things that are really useful but mm-hmm. then you're going to cherry pick a few things from Deleuze and Guattari and dismiss them entirely and everything they've produced because of these couple of things you don't like. Well, because I think it's core to them. That's the thing. So the core of Lacan, I think, is so good. Like the core of Lacan I go with, when the core of Deleuze is, and it's probably Guattari more than Deleuze, actually, but they're, they're the core is the thing that I'm not so hot on. In fact, it's the it's the little other bits and pieces I I quite like. I can take little bits of like their Deleuze's understanding of the death drive and primal repression. I like all of that, but there's something I think about the centrality of the work that I'm more critical of. Um, but I'm still reading out the Oedipus, so we'll see how I go. Maybe I will be converted, you know. <laughs> Do you not like the idea of rhizomatic thinking and the idea that it kind of spreads out? all over the place at one time and it's not linear like that I feel is somewhat applicable to lots of things in everyday life yes and you know and I love the there is a a real freedom in the kind of bricolage kind of thing where like they they're very and this this resonates with me even personally like of breaking free from all of these kind of like social constraints that without even realizing that you think you have to go to school you think you have to then date you have to get a job then you have to get married and you have to get like all these things that you just kind of feel you have to do there's something about reading Deleuze that is that is genuinely kind of like uh starts to show that you can be freed from these. I mean, you can still do them, but there's other possibilities. There's other ways to live. There's other ways to create and recreate your life. Apart from like going it. to school, boys, going to school is essential. <laughs> it's non-negotiable. It's really important. Good. Yes. Oh, th- there you go. That's my issue with Deleuze. And I think Guattari, I need to look this up, but I've got a feeling he was part of one of those experiments that they did in France in like the 60s and 70s, where you would have a type of uh, mental health asylum, but were, but the doctors and the patients would all be equal, no hierarchy, living together, hanging out together, yeah. talking together. And this is like, yeah, severe psych- psychosis. Like this wasn't just kind of like neurotic kind of like pathologies this is severe psychosis and um you know that that kind of experiment i just don't think works i think it's even deleuze didn't like that you know he thought it was kind of mad well it Um, It had huge issues major problems yeah and 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 that's the big thing because deleuze talks about um schizoanalysis there's no schizo and there's psychoanalysts, but can you find one schizoanalysis out there? And if they can't, don't go to them. <laughs> what was that? <laughs> oh, you broke up there. Yeah, but I didn't say anything. I was just laughing oh. at you. Yeah, because uh, because I, I can I send someone to a Deleuze and oh, I'm getting away. <laughs> I'd even be scared to send them to a Lacanian, to be honest. But yeah. <laughs> do you want to double check if there's anything in the chat? Oh yes, I will do. Thank you. Uh, oh, this is great it's chatting. We should, I wish we should do this more often. Um, oh, there's lots of comments. Let's see if, um, oh, Zach says, I, I always felt that Pete not telling personal stories is because he doesn't want people to treat him like a guru. Ah, that's very true. He, he wants to short circuit that impulse of making leader fall or thing. Zach, that's, that's very true. Um, that there's a certain sense, which, and anybody who knows me, Right. And I, I know a lot of the people now. I know a lot of people who are part of this Patreon because that's the nature of it. It connects you. And and whenever you come to my events, we all hang out and have a drink. And there's that. But there is also a certain sense in which you want to like the analyst when you have an analyst. 
the, the less you know about them, the more you can project onto them and the more that you see they become a mirror and the more that they can become a kind of like a, a harbor for what's called that sting for the unknowing. And so there is a very important thing where I have to a large extent try to be that in my work. But that's also difficult because I also enjoy hanging out and having a drink with people or whatever. But there is a certain sense in which in the work, I try as much as possible to, to be a, a mirror. Uh, and, and so the less you know, the better in many ways. And Zach, I would agree with you that, yes, he tries yes. to do that. The problem is that once you've been around him for a while, it's not hard to see the lack and the Con conflict and the ways in which he is just as flawed as anyone else and once you see those it doesn't matter if you know his backstory because you're not going to hold him up as any kind of guru at that point anyway yes that's true don't tell people that that's the secret Shh. <laughs> yeah that's that's the last insight yes but um very true very true well, the whole reason that i started doing my very first zoom room was because you were doing coffee and concept every week without fail. And it was the absolute lifeline for so many people. And then for some reason, I don't know if you got bored or you felt like you ran out of material or you just couldn't be bothered, but you decided to make it monthly instead. And at that point we were in full lockdown. I was having no other adult interaction and oh. lots of adult child interaction every day. And it was driving me slowly insane. So I decided that I would make up for your shortfall. And that was how I ended up doing my first weekly coffee and concept session. Oh, that's fair. That's great to hear, actually. Yes, because I remember that. And this is a thing like we we haven't got into this at all. But like, you know, Kate was was, you know, got involved in atheism for Lent and then you know, I was doing stuff regularly and then I kind of was doing less stuff and Kate was just like, I'm going to start doing stuff. And then she kept doing stuff and she kept being around. I was like, okay, can we work together a bit? So Kate has continually been doing stuff. And can I tell them about the thing that you're going to do? Hopefully from next month with that, right? Yeah. So yes. I was absolutely fed up to the back teeth of the fact that Pete never talks about his own work. And he's been doing this philosophy, psychoanalysis, theology stuff for a while. And we do all kinds of lovely articles and book studies and discussions. And I don't think he's ever mentioned. Well, yeah, he's mentioned that he's writing books, but those <laughs> books never appear. So I don't actually believe he's writing anything. Yes. Um, he just subjects us to endless four discourses for his own amusement, I think, to see how long he can get away with it. Um, I can't believe I get away with it for so long. I can't believe people I, still follow. The four discourses was boring, but very important. Very important. Really anyway. boring. And <laughs> but really important. <laughs> yeah, but we still haven't seen the jolly book. So oh, yeah, what was the true. point? Yeah. Um, but anyway, uh, so I decided that we've had enough and I am going to start running a monthly reading group on extracts from Pete's books um, or articles that are not ones that Pete has been doing that would be useful. Um, so maybe a bit of Pete stuff, bit of Caputo, a uh, bit of Tillich because I love Tillich. Um, <laughs> and a bit of other things. We have done a lot of Tillich though, so maybe we'll save that for later. Um, and it and might make... even be videos, it might be podcasts yeah. as well, sorry, yep. Yeah, all kinds of stuff. So making it more like the AFL reflections in length that we can then discuss, but you don't need to have a degree in philosophy to be able to interact with it because I have no formal training in philosophy or psychoanalysis or theology. Um, I just like talking about them. So it's more of a just come as you are and discuss, and it will be at a level where we actually use words that people understand. And we use concepts that make sense to most people. And you don't need to know a million different terms in order to just get through the material. Brilliant. And that will be the last Saturday of the month. At uh, no, because that's when um, oh, exposure, exposure is. is. So we haven't, is it going to be the third Saturday third. of the month? 
It's third Saturday of the month is going to be, and it'll be at 11.30 a.m. if you live on the West Coast of America, and it will be 6.30, 7.30 p.m. if you live in the UK, and 8.30 p.m. if you live where Kate lives. <laughs> No, you were that's doing wrong. so well. Oh, no, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. But that's going to be <laughs> once a month. That's great. And and the thing is, see this that I'm doing with Kate. This is kind of, I'm going to do these publicly now on my YouTube. You can hit subscribe, hit notification, and once a month I'll do a live, either talk or more often this year I want to do conversations and as many as possible I'll be doing live. So there'll be some like this where we're doing it on Zoom. And there'll be others where we're sitting on my sofa with interesting people having conversations. So that's once a month. And then the second week, which is next week, we'll have coffee and concepts. And then the other two Sundays of the month, I will be doing short extracts from books or videos that I think are cool and discussions. So that's kind of going to be the structure. This is the free one. The other stuff is part, you have to be subscribed to Patreon. Um, but, uh, but, you know, giving you as much free stuff as possible. So, yeah. Anything else we need to tell people? Yeah, we need to go through the chat because you said there are a lot of comments and you've read one. I, I wear a lot of comments, but I didn't see any questions. Let me have a okay. little look. Uh, no, uh, going through. Um, oh, yeah, Brian just said he, I think he's responding to the conversation, but it's an interesting comment. He says, going through a deconstruction and feeling I had to leave the church because it felt hypocritical was exactly my experience. This online community was critical for me not feeling alone. Oh, that's great to hear. That's great. And that's why we need to do, <laughs> need to keep it going. Um, I know it's it's an, an important transitional thing for people to have a community when they're going through this. Um, O'Reilly says, please may I ask, after LL uh, of those name drops, why does Pete not have any interaction? Oh, with the work of Don, Don Cupid. After LL, I don't know what LL stands for, sorry, but I go like, why does Pete not have any interaction with the work of Don Cupid? Kate, do you know who Don Cupid is? No. Oh, yeah. He's fascinating. I met him once. Um, uh, I went to a conference. I was actually invited to go to, He's there's a movement called the Sea of Faith. I mean, it's a very small movement now, but very important in the 60s. Um, Don Cupid was basically the British version of Thomas Altizer. Um, and we've done a little bit of Thomas Altizer, and he was a lovely guy. Um, I'm guessing he passed away. Uh, he was quite elderly when I met him. He was this strong, tall, fiery guy who was kind of the British death of God person. Um, and I loved meeting him. And I've read a good few of his books. Um, his work is not, it hasn't, it, it well... You know, yeah, it, it, it hasn't been a work that's kind of like um, I've uh, really felt in, too inspired by. But actually, he's very clear as a writer. He, he writes, he wrote a lot. That was one issue. So finding the right book to do. But Don Cupid could be somebody we should do, actually, um, because he wrote very well, very clearly. Um, and so, yeah, sorry. So I've never mentioned Don Cupid, but I know who you're talking about. As I say, I was very happy to have met him once and um, go to one sea of faith. Oh, and I'll tell you one story about him. So I went to this event and uh, he, part of this conference, they were talking about the future of the sea of faith movement, which he basically set up and he ran. And he's this big figure for a lot of people, a very important figure. And they had this very important meeting that they were doing at the conference. And I was outside. I'm not part of the Sea of Faith. So I was outside. I was having a coffee. And he was there having a coffee as well. And I was like, went over to him, went, are they not having this like meeting about like the future of Sea of Faith and all that? And he was like, yeah, yeah. And I was like, should you not be in there? And he was like, oh, no, no, no. He says like, kind of like a, that would be uh, my my presence would kind of like, uh, be too strong. Yeah. You know, like they've got to work this out and, you know, it's better if I'm not involved. And he was the most humble guy. And this little moment where he said, Oh God, no, I wouldn't be in there because like, that's like, this is not, it's not about me. And, and I think that if I was in there, what I said would be weighted too heavily. I'll just have a coffee with you. Uh, it was very, very beautiful. And he said to me, and he said at that time, he, cause he was coming near the end of his life. And he said like, 
you know, I'm trying to divest as much as possible in terms of my authority and my influence and my possessions. And he said, like, uh, he said, there's a tradition where the first half of your life you accumulate and the second half of your life you give up. And he said, and the ideal is by the time you're in your deathbed, I think there's a Russian thing where even on your deathbed, the final thing you give away is the bed itself and you die without even the bed. And he said, you know, this is what I aspire to. It was very beautiful. Uh, let me see if there's anything else. Um, oh, he's still still alive in his 90s. Oh, that's great to hear, Ray. Um, I, I'm not surprised. Both him and Thomas Altizer are the fittest <laughs> guys I've ever met. I met Thomas Altizer when he was about 80, and he was healthier than I was, you know, so, yeah, still cool. So you've just spent five minutes talking about how this guy's probably dead. And he's, not. and he's still alive and well. Yes, yeah, so apologies to Dawn. <laughs> Um, and I'm really glad to, he to hear it. <laughs> um, we'll do little one more little comment. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, Chris says, after several past exchanges with Pete, I recommend psychosis. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, I reckon Chris would like Deleuze. You're, uh, Chris is one of our heretics. We have a group called the Heretics Corner, uh, that Kate you're a part of on a regular basis, and Bill is, and it's uh, it's it's mostly people slagging me off, is that right? <laughs> yes. It started like that, it's developed yeah. a bit from there, but there is a lot of, yeah, critique. Critique, Effect. and Chris Effect. is one of the main critiquers, which is great. I remember the first time, I don't know if it's the first time I met Chris, I think it was actually, when he was smoking outside of Wake, and I always remember him every time I see him at Wake, he's never really in there, he's always outside having a cigarette, and that's kind of like, that's Chris's symbolic role in paro theology. He's the guy outside having the cigarette, asking very good questions, and uh, you're loved for it. Um, yeah, so any final thoughts from you, Kate, before we finish off and I win my poker match next door well I think that's very delusional of you but good yes. luck <laughs> thank you <laughs> keep holding on to that positivity um no oh um so having kind of we're coming towards the end of Boothby mm -hmm. yeah we have having like finally it's yes, done yep yeah um What's next? What's next? Yes, this that's a very good question. And so sometimes I do a theme. And as Kate says, like, uh, uh, you know, sometimes I kind of will concentrate on a person uh, or a concept. So the four discourses were for a while. Richard Boothby, we did. Todd McGowan. The thing that's on my mind is having interesting conversations for the next, for 2023. So not so much a theme. Uh, but more a type, a different format. So my hope is I, I've been doing these seminars now for, I mean, it might be eight, 10 years, I don't know. And it's mostly me just looking at a camera and speaking. So what I want to do is, is people like Kate uh, have conversations and see where those conversations go. Sometimes it'll be with an artist or a musician or a writer or so just different people. And uh, maybe trying to kind of like, uh, see how this influences and affects everyday life and how it engages with different disciplines. So that's that's the kind of primary thought I have in my head. And that's what you, if you're watching this, will have every month if you want to watch live or later, mostly conversations unless I can't find somebody and then I'll do the odd one just speaking to the camera. But that's what I'm hoping to do um, for kind of see out a lot of the year uh, unless you've got a better idea, Kate. I have many, but <laughs> you have all heard it here. He has said in public that they are going to be interesting conversations. They're not just conversations. They're going to be interesting. They're going to be interesting. Interesting conversations, 100%. And the first one might be with Barry. Well, the first one is this one. And the first live one might be with Barry Taylor, because I'm going to try and get Barry out next month to sit on my sofa. So this is the first one. The first live one will be next month, hopefully. And then um, I've got some very interesting, colorful local friends. So um, I'll, I'll pull some of them in. Do you understand the term live? 
because we are having this conversation in real time as people are watching. That is the definition of live. What did I say? Live in person. I should say live and in person, you know, okay. um, if that makes it, I don't know if that'll make any difference at all, but I kind of like the, I mean, I wanted to get Kate out for this, but um, she's been resistant. You've been resistant to come out to Belfast. So, but I know I why you can't. Yes, you have a job and you have kids, but that's no excuse. But uh, yes, but if uh, at some stage we'll have a live com- live and in-person conversation. Yes, we shall indeed. Brilliant. Oh, listen, thanks so much for doing this. Thanks for everybody who's been watching this. Um, and uh, next week it's Coffee and Concepts if you're on Patreon. Um, and uh, other than that, uh, I will see you next month. Oh, we're doing Fight Club as well uh, for exposure. And I'm going to go to that. So the last Saturday of the month, we're going to be doing Exposure. Or sorry, we're going to be doing Fight Club, which is a great, really interesting movie. Great movie. Fantastic. All right. Take care, everybody.